be sponsoring this event, uh, BYU Women's Studies, as well as the Office of Civic Engagement tonight. Uh, this is the first, not the first, uh, we've had some other events already going on for Women's History Month. Did you know it's Women's History Month? <laughs> uh, BYU Women's Studies is happy to bring you a number of events, and this, this is just one of them. Uh, we've got some flyers that you can pick up. We hope to see you again. I want to mention one in particular that we're super excited about, and that will take place on March 17th. It's a Thursday at 11 a.m. over in the Education Design Auditorium. Uh, we'll have with us Kate Fulbrook, who is a Women's History Specialist up in the Church History Department and one of the editors for this new fabulous volume of documents um, that tell us all about the first 50 years of the LDS Relief Society. So we're super excited that, that Kate Fulbrook is coming. Um, we're really excited to have Joan Trumpauer Mulholland and her son Loki with us tonight. I'll say a few more things about them. You'll get to know Joan even more. You already have a flavor for her today. Uh, but we'll start with a prayer, and that will be given by Laurel Peacock, who is a senior. Uh, she's in neuroscience and has minors in women's studies and international development. Uh, okay, um, she's also shared her story. 
story, of course, with college, uh, college students across uh, the country, with elementary school, junior high and high school students, as well as at uh, museums and other civic gatherings. So we're really happy to have her with us tonight.
counters we used to go out of town and to buy candy or something. We couldn't sit at the counter. We couldn't even uh, go downtown and eat at a lot of the restaurants. Uh, downtown in D.C. They said we were supposedly equals. We were being treated that way. And I suddenly pissed off this white person. They had all kinds of things at their disposal to, take, to, to do me in. And there was nothing I could do about it. He said, um, you're ringing that light. My dad said, no, sir, I didn't run the light. It was yellow. Morris, I said, you, you ran that light. My dad didn't tell you. And he looked at us in the back seat. And I guess we looked like a nice little family. And he said, um, Morris, you like a good thing. So I'm going to let you off. I'm going to let you off this time. Well, it was a um, separate and unequal society. Uh, basically buttressed by uh, local customs and laws. But that was that was just the way things were. You want to go? What do you mean? That's the way things were. I met whites all over who had questions raised. I later met blacks who, when they had questions raised, their parents had to tell them, uh, "It may be wrong, but don't you try to do anything about it. This is in God's hands." Um, Here's how you protect yourself. Maybe you shouldn't ride the bus so much if that upsets you. Your parents did that, but they also told you that it would come to an end. Because it was wrong. Anything that's that wrong can't last. Doing. 
And I think mostly that a lot of them truly believe that. But um, you had the world of the, the white folks who were dominant, even in states where the majority of the population was African American. And you had the world of the African Americans, which was they survived at the mercy of the white folks. Separate was not equal. The Supreme Court had said so, but not much had happened after the Supreme Court said so. And um, so the students, particularly on my campus in Mississippi, were out to change that. Just to back a little bit to it, uh, how you got that decision? say, oh, Northern Virginia, that's not a South. I say the state law was the state law. It applied everywhere. And Robert E. Lee was my homeboy. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you some good things about Robert E. Lee, but we'll save that for later. Maybe. My mother was from rural Georgia, and you know the big thrill of the summer was going down to see Grandma. And um, however bad things might be in Northern Virginia, which were not really apparent to me as a child. When you got down in rural Georgia, let me tell you about the town where my grandma lived. It's called Oconee. There was a dirt road that ran through. The houses were not much more than shacks. And the railroad track ran right down the middle of the road. That, that was really pitiful. They had just gotten in plumbing. Uh, in the late 50s, cold water. But you didn't drink that water because little fish might come out of the faucet. And you little kids could go fishing down at the sort, you know, the, where they had impounded the water. So this was not, you know, as we like to think of the last century, second half of the last century. Well, I had a little girl I played with every year. Her name was Mary. And by the time we were about 10, and we had bicycles, we could ride down there. She dared me to take our bikes down to the Coca-Cola bottling plant and go walk through what we call nigger town. Now, this year I have come to find out that the folks who live back on that stretch of road are called the Porters which to me still harkens back to plantation life. Well, we went, left our bikes by the Coca-Cola bottling plant and went. Went on back where we weren't supposed to go. And everybody who saw these two little white girls coming just sort of faded into the background. And they were out sweeping their yard. Don't mow your yard, just sweep it because you don't have any grass. <laughs> or hanging up the law, the wash. They saw these two little white girls coming and they just made themselves scared. They just went on behind the house, <coughs> went inside. They might have been peeping out at us, but they disappeared. That, that seemed a little strange, not too friendly. And then we came to where the school was. It was a one-room, unpainted shack up on rickety looking piles, not even nicely built up piles. No glass in the windows, just shutters. The door was open, and we could see the pot-bellied stove. And outside, I'm not sure now if it was a well or a pump, but one outhouse. That was the school for all of the black kids that he Now for the white kids, just out the other end of the town, there was this brand new, fancy brick building, post-World War II. And it was the most magnificent building, as far as I knew, for miles around. Now this was a, so unfair. White kids had this brand new, spiffy building to go to school. And the black kids, 
had been shacked. And that just really <coughs> struck me like a knife in my soul. And I resolved then that when I had the chance, as a Southerner, I was going to do what I could to make the South the best that it could be for everybody in the South. That opportunity came. When I was in high school, we would have a secret meeting in our church based on white students, high school students, and black ones, the school integration was, was coming. Board orders were looming. And somebody, I'm still not sure who, whether it was the minister, white ministers, someone in the black community, or I've even had it suggested it was the county government. Somebody thought it would be a good idea if some of the black students, some of the white students, got to know each other over spaghetti dinner, got to know each other as people, so that when school integration did come, we'd be better prepared for it and in a better position to, at least the white students, to keep things calm. And that was it until I, the freedom of the Rights of sit ins took place in 1960. This is Women's History Month, right? And who started the sit ins? Four guys from AT, right? You know what I'm about? Four guys went and sat down. Girls, let me tell you. And guys, you listen too. It wasn't those guys who got the idea. The ladies. Ladies of Bennett College, the all women's college in Greensboro, they had been talking about the situation. They had been having outside advisors come and talk to them from Tennessee. I think Jim Lawson probably, maybe Vincent Harding. But they had been getting philosophically tuned to nonviolence. They had been, I think, practicing rules of nonviolence and, you know, role play. And they were talking about going down to those dime stores where your money was good over here by at school supplies. But don't you dare take your money over to the lunch counter and try to get something to eat. This was before McDonald's was even thought. Well, the guys, they invited the guys to come join them as things moved along. And don't you know those guys just jumped the gun on the ladies of Benham? Didn't tell them they were going to do it. They just went on down to Woolworth and sat down. And they're the ones you see in the history books. <laughs> Girls didn't get down there until the next day. But as soon as they got word of it the next day, they were right down there with the guys. But remember, it was the ladies that started. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now we're going to go on the Freedom Line. That was in 1961, and went all through the South, testing out compliance with the Supreme Court ruling from December of 1960. Okay, let's go. Lights, camera, action. This was an idea that caught the imagination of the country. However, the civil rights community thought it was a bit of a, a lark. Um, they thought, all oh, right, we're, you know, we're just going to ride our buses through the South, you know, for a couple of months. Um, it was almost seen as like a vacation. And some of the people who actually participated initially were viewed as, you know, people who were just, you know, slackers. They didn't want to do the hard work of going and demonstrating in front of, you know, uh, hardcore uh, places. So they were just going to take a bus. I think we knew from the start it could be dangerous. On the other hand, maybe to break the tension, maybe half thinking it. Um, we were teasing Hank and said that, you know, hey, you went off on this all expense paid vacation. Good way to end the semester, buddy. How I spent my summer in 1961, let me tell you the ways. <laughs> they put together a small group of 13 riders, I think it was 13. We left Washington on two separate buses, making their way through the Upper South. In the Upper South, they were attacked a few times. A couple of people were being uh, arrested, uh, most notably in Rock Hill, South Carolina. 
But really all hell broke loose when they got to Alabama. And all of a sudden, it made national news and everybody realized this was not just a walk in the park. This was the next stage of the revolution. I had already had a taste as seeing the violence. I just barely escaped the plan. So I had no illusions whatsoever about what was going to happen next. I didn't know anything about Anderson, Alabama, and then we were told that we are literally going into the belly of the beast. Uh, Anderson was a hotbed of Klan activity. And as a matter of fact, uh, Jim Farmer, who was a pretty good stump speaker, um, spoke that night and told a joke about Anderson in terms of foretelling what we were going to be in for it. He said, there was this bus driver driving a Greyhound bus, and as he got maybe three or four miles from Anderson, he heard this knock-knock thumping on the side of the bus, so he pulled over to see what it was, and as he opened the door, the Greyhound had gotten down off of the side of the bus and wanted to come inside. And so he asked and said, why do you want to do that? He said, we get ready to go into Anderson. <laughs> And there were variations of that joke of, he said, one preacher said, Lord, we're getting ready to go down to Alabama and we want you to be with us. And there was silence. And uh, he said, Lord, did you hear me? I want you to be with us. So he heard that voice, I'll go with you. As far as I understood. <laughs> so all kinds of joke about how dangerous it was going to be. And surely enough, we got maybe a few miles outside of Anderson, but we'd all have been singing um, on the bus, and as we did that from time to time, a bus coming from Anderson stopped on the opposite side of the highway, and the two bus drivers got out and spoke. And the driver of our bus got back on and looked, kind of looked at us and just kind of smiled. Um, and uh, as we got into Anderson, the streets were deserted. No one. telling us this is not good. A mob firebombed the bus as churchgoers brought their children to watch the Freedom Riders burn alive on Mother's Day. Riders were able to escape, only to be beaten with baseball bats until the local authorities' bodies stepped in. Freedom Riders were attacked two more times in Birmingham and Montgomery, where it appeared things would come to an end. But a call back to my mother in D.C. to send more riders, and a team led by Diane Nash in Nashville re-energized everyone. However, my mother and the Freedom Runners were now entering Mississippi, a place many would call the Heart of Darkness. Joan went on an unusual freedom ride. She and a group from Washington, which included uh, the, the activists and later SNCC uh, chairman, uh, Stokely Carmichael, flew from Washington to New Orleans, which is where the Freedom Rides were supposed to end. And from New Orleans, they took a train to Jackson and therefore integrated yet another uh, facility, not the bus depot, but the train depot. You stepped off the bus or out of the train and we went into the waiting room and together, and whether it was the black one or the white one, told to move on and move out. Uh, by Captain Ray, did you all hear me? You gonna do it? You're under arrest and out to the paddy wagon and from there to the city jail and then you had your trial so-called which was also down to absolute routine and over to the county jail Nick. 
my teacher represented, it was a loose-knit group of, group of um, student groups. But a lot of us had met, some of us had met each other at twice a year conventions or the group in Baltimore, like, like the group from D.C. to help out with something, the group in Rock Hill said, we're going to go to jail. More of y'all come from across the South and through slow mail sent out notices to people. Well, when folks who had been on the bus for the fire bomb, the smoke inhalation and beatings, and the folks who were beaten have senseless in Birmingham could not continue, were physically unable to continue the ride. Students from SNCC across the South came in. Mostly we hear about Diane Nash's group in Nashville, and they, they were very active, and a lot of students came from Nashville, and they got there first. They were the closest. But just as quickly, three students were on their way from the Howard University, including Dion, who you saw earlier, because Hank was one of our group. So of course we're going to go. Students from Richmond, including uh, Reggie Green, within a week he was going, um, from Atlanta, that group there, and from New Orleans, and maybe some others. They were all converging to keep the Freedom Rides going. That was in the spirit of God. We said we follow Jesus Christ and God. Nonviolence. Turn the other cheek, and if one person falls, somebody else steps up to take their place. That was Gandhi's teaching. And we used to debate when we could get a copy of Gandhi's biography of the jail. We were reading that and discussing it in the jail cells and at the lunch counters. So we kept the freedom rights going. By the time I well, one of the guys that first went from D.C., Paul Dietrich, he ended up, they all ended up down in Montgomery, in a church that was surrounded by a mob and marshals, who I think were basically from the post office, as I recollect, somebody made marshals. Um, there was a mob that was throwing rocks at the church, breaking the windows. Marshall set off tear gas to drive them back while the wind carried the tear gas to the marshals and into the church. <clears throat> and people were trapped all night. But there were two phone lines into the church. And each family unit or group would send one person to the basement to make about a three minute phone call at a time bomb. Paul knew that I was in a small apartment phone was within reach of my bed, he called me, and he said, this is more or less literally, Joan, we're trapped in the church in Montgomery. I can't talk, but send more writers. So we started more and more people coming from our D.C. group. We were second only to Nashville, total number three. I Six Julie flew with a group from our power group down to New Orleans. The next day we took the train into Jackson and I ended up having free room and board for the summer, compliments of Mississippi. <laughs> Jackson, Mississippi. Okay, so we're going to move on. He's telling you what to do. Good this time. Uh, we're going to see about the sit in to Jackson, Mississippi. Now it came a little bit later. Mississippi was behind the times. But it's probably the most famous sit in photo, the most used now. There was so much violence in the air, but none happening at the moment that picture was snapped. That it's really good to put in books with kids. And so, 
pieces, more than you, sort of the anatomy of the sit-in, more than you ever thought you wanted to know. <coughs> Recognize the photo? This new movement would explode on May 28, 1963, when John Salter and Regan Evans took the Jackson boycott to the next level. In all, 14 people would participate in what would become one of the most famous and violent sit-ins of the civil rights movement. I've heard at various times from the reporter, the cameraman, and the son of one of the reporters that this was the most terrifying, frightening event they covered in the civil rights movement. Now, I guess they weren't in Birmingham and Montgomery with the Freedom Riders, but they got around. And, um, this to them was the worst. Everyone believed that the, the students would be immediately arrested and carted off to jail. And so no one thought that that was going to cause much of a ruckus. They really had their hopes pinned on the integrated group of demonstrators um, outside the store, down the street. When the three individuals, uh, Perlina Lewis, Memphis Norman, and Ann Moody, sat down at the white counter, nothing happened. Now Joan, interestingly, was not supposed to be part of this demonstration. She was what was called a spotter, and she was supposed to spot the uh, demonstration, the protests going on down the street. But the picket line was arrested more or less immediately. It was sort of lasting a while. So Lois and I phoned in a report on that, and um, then they would, Med uh, Medgar's office would know to get the lawyers and bonds money together. And it was sort of like, okay, what do we do now? This was a block or so up the street. And um, he said, well, let's go check in what's happening at Woolworth. They had no idea that, that, that this environment had turned uh, volatile until they walked into the store. And it was right at that moment that a, a, a thug, a former police officer, had come in, a, a, you know, racist, virulent segregation came in and pulled Memphis Norman, the one black male, off of his stool, knocked him onto the floor and began kicking him mercilessly. Um, Memphis, you know, curled up into a, a ball and was trying to protect himself in the way that he had been taught. Meanwhile, I was back at the NAACP offices in the Masonic Temple uh, when a quick hurry call came. Medgar and, and John, and others in the office, had to make the decision, do we call it off and try to rescue the last two people who were there? Um, and then if we didn't call it off, how could we leave just two people at that counter? Would we have volunteers to go in? So I set out to head for the Woolworth store. Medgar wanted to come, and I persuaded him not to because I said you're a marked man. And the way this thing is developing, you know, you could get killed. John was then stuck in the situation wondering what's going to happen next. Um, Ann Moody had been pulled off of her stool and thrown against some of the counters. Um, Perlina Lewis was also pulled from the stool and was down on, uh, was down on her knees right by the counter when the police officer came on the scene. Both of them rushed back to the counter and so that so that they were so the demonstration would continue. Joan sees all this and realizes, first of all, she is beginning to communicate with the, the demonstrator. She's she sees a man with a knife walk by Ann Moody and she calls out, um, Annie, he's got a knife. Um, and all of a sudden she's identified with the people at the counter. Who is this white girl talking to those black girls, you know? So all of a sudden, she realizes that she's in danger. But then I sat down. That's when I became a problem. She walked through that mom in the war star. And they realize, of course, immediately where she stood. She joins Perlina and Andy at the counter, the first white to join the demonstration. And at this, the crowd is just incensed. They become like hornets. They start screaming at her. I went immediately to the lunch counter to sit with Joan and Annie Moody. When Salter joined, the crowd turned violent. He was 
knocked in the back of his head with uh, brass knuckles. Um, there was a student who put his cigarette out on the back of Salter's neck. There were several cigarettes, and you can still see it to this day if you look on the back of his neck, he has scars in the shape of a cigarette. Um, they threw pepper and water mixture into his eyes. Things were just going out of control. And at that point, Joan had said that she believed that they were not going to make it out alive. None of them were going to make it out alive. And then the president of the 
United States was assassinated. 1963 was not a good year. It was just that one wonderful day in Washington that was good. Okay, here we go. On September 15th, 1963, tragedy would befall the most innocent of victims in the battle for racial equality. But a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church. We've all seen the footage of people getting sprayed by the water hoses and, and things like that. Well, that was the, pro the protests that were going on at that time. And they were essentially being staged on the 16th Street Baptist Church because it was a downtown church. And they could gather there and then leave from there for their protest. And that, so that's what was happening. Well, the Klan didn't like that. So what they did is they planted a bomb underneath the steps on the side of that church. And it blew up at about 10.22 in the morning. In fact, the, these, these girls were getting ready. There was a youth service that morning. And in fact, the title of the lesson was called The Love That Forgives. And the, and the bomb blew up and killed those four girls. Time for sadness. There was nothing to celebrate. Glass that we picked up out of the gutters at the 16th Street Baptist Church. The day that three of the little girls who had been blown up there were buried. And the police shot over the heads of the people who came out of the church to disperse the mob, right? We attend the funeral, we were staying outside and uh, we were going to follow the cartels until uh, Ed King and uh, Diane Nash pointed and showed us the um, National Guard standing with guns aimed down at us in the streets. The, the National Guard who had, been who had been nationalized by the President of the United States had rebel flags on their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And I was holding this American flag, which was not liked. They just fell in love with the American flag recently in the South. And so just the flag was a sign of resistance that I was holding. And so you could see them standing all up around with the guns drawn. Over there on top of the church? Yeah, all around. I didn't look up at it. And so uh, <laughs> Ed and Diane said, look, 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 look. The same way they did at Megas funeral in Jackson when John Doe came out and started screaming and yelling and said, uh, you must stop because they are going to shoot you, pointing to the guns aimed at people in the streets down Ferris Street. It would have been like sharp or massacre. We're not sure they were going to shoot us. Oh, but we were standing. You're not sure? No. The church, you talking about during the time the funeral was going on? Yes, ma'am. They just blown the church up there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 was inside, so she was killed in the funeral. There were a lot of people standing in front of that church. And I don't know whether they were going to shoot or not, but if there was any restraint to be had of that day, they would have had it. We bring from these experiences different feelings, you know, impressions, and so on. Well, this is reality. I'm the other. Yes, ma'am. <laughs>
have some posters up here. Oh, I have a hand up. Oh. much support from your families and family and friends back home? Um, well, by then I had lost touch with my friends from back home, except for the Howard group. And my mother was from the rural south, and she was completely against it. No support. The women ruled the roost back then. No financial support. I mean, she it went against everything she had been brought up leaving. My father was from southwest Iowa and supported our objectives, but he was against the, the tactics. It was like non-violent guerrilla warfare, a lunch counter here and a lunch counter there, here a lunch counter, there a lunch counter. Um, he thought you should change the law at the top. And it would affect the whole country. He had good government bureaucrats. But of course, the students felt that Half our lifetime ago, so it was Brown versus Board of Education, the school desegregation issue, and how much it changed? <coughs> Not much. And um, I think my father was primarily concerned that his darling daughter was going to get killed, which was a distinct possibility. Being from the South, and I'm not from this country, and it's always been confusing to me, but since you're from the South, what else the um, it stands. I don't get emotionally upset by it. Um, it stands for a country that lost a <coughs> war. Um, I've never understood why, if the United States was formed by secession. British common, you know, nations, the southern states did not have the right of succession. And I just don't get it. Um, but the Confederate flag, of which, under which some of my relatives died, um, has become a symbol of hate, both in the minds of outsiders looking at the South symbolized state, and the people who really supported it wanted flying in the South. It was put into the southern states flags once the civil rights states got going. It hasn't been there all along. And the people that want it in the South are, it's the symbol of their hatred, so they wouldn't call it that. Um, I'm glad it's coming down to be in museums. But I also think it should be at the graves of the uh, Confederate soldiers who died. I guess the day they put the flags on the graves, they should get the flag they died in front of the it's, it's not easy. Can I accept part of that? I'm sorry. So my, I just spent some time in the South. Um, so when I, you see from the homes, I think that means that they're against the federal government, they're against 
against the president because he's black and they want segregation to occur. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I am from Northern Virginia as well, easy area A. Eh? <laughs> um, and I have definitely seen the negative effects and consequences of segregation. Um, the more I, talk about, I just was curious from your eyes, um, what are some of those consequences that you've seen from segregation and how can we combat? And then that my son could write a book on this. Um, because of segregation, the lack of job opportunities, the inherent, the, the inherent wealth of African Americans is way below that of white Americans. Uh, it used, they used to be they couldn't get mortgages to buy houses, even under the GI Bill. Um, That's an example on that. The study that was done in the suburbs of New York and New Jersey of the 67,000 mortgages guaranteed by the GI Bill, 100 was non white. And the policy 70 years later enthralled that in the entire country, which you end up having, having 70 years later, is that for every dollar a white person has in wealth, a black person has in 15 cents. And it's directly tied back to that one policy. And then the compounding effects of 400 years of all sorts of policy. So uh, to correct that, it's going to take several hundred more years for the economic discrimination that people like that. That's the effects. Thank you. What do you think we can do first? And also, I think voting, the fact that there were people did not, African Americans did not have, and often poor whites, the right to vote, meant that segregation is conservative. People were elected locally and to Congress, and they passed the laws including having to work hard to overturn. Um, what you can do, it's easy to say take it to the streets, but I would think a simpler answer, you know, a more direct, feasible answer is vote. Encourage other people to vote. Whichever way you see politics, at least vote. bugging someone else, it's bugging a whole lot of other students. Get together and work on getting rid of whatever you don't like. Yes, um, so I have seen in the past like couple years, I think especially in the African American community, um, there's a very serious concern about police brutality, which I think also echoes in like the 60s. And so I was wondering if you could give us maybe some insight on what progress you think has been made and what progress you think should or still should happen in this area. Yeah, this police brutality issue, black men being shot, the progress we made is we now know about it, we talk about it, it's in the news. When they were dredging the river for those three Freedom Summer workers, who disappeared, and they were only dredging the rivers because two of those guys were white. They found, I forget, I don't remember the exact number, but it was well over 20 black men who had got no coverage in the press, abducted, killed, sunk in the river. So I see it as progress that we know about it. But I don't, with the numbers, I don't know if they're any lower now than they were. But I'm glad, glad it's out there. It's, it's hard to do things. Like, it's easy to feel things, but it's hard to do things. So I'm just wondering what your main motivation was to be brave and get involved and take airplanes and buses. And well, as a kid, I went to Sunday school. We had to memorize verses. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have us do unto you. And as we got it right, we got a gold star in our Bible. I got a pretty good collection. <laughs> but I could see clearly that we weren't practicing what we preached. We said we believed this, but we weren't doing it. And I thought we should get over it. 
I didn't know the word democracy yet, but I thought we should practice it on the street. And as a Southerner, I thought I should work when I could on making it better in the South. Um, what do you think is the main cause the polarization of the All Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter movement. The All Lives Matter movement is nonsense. That's part of polarizing. Amen. From there. <laughs> Saying All Lives Matter almost sounds segregated. The movement started to focus on blacks who historically have been killed. Underfed, under, you know, particularly the killing. But if they're going to make a highway or redevelop an area, who's the neighborhood that they destroy? It's the black lives that are going to affect the most. And I think all lives matter is just a reaction to this. Now, I think everybody's life is important, but I wouldn't put down the black lives matter. I came here primarily because the women's studies department uh, recommended that I come. Um, you get extra credit, I hope? I don't. I'm just, just here to listen to you. But um, I was just wondering um, what this movement meant to you as a woman and how what other, what other young women in college in particular can gain from your example, like um, what they can learn about being being a more integrated part of their communities and uh, making a difference. Well, they say that this, the civil rights movement was you know, put down when it was way ahead of the rest of society at that time. Um, sometimes the guys wanted to protect us. It's the press that didn't pick up on us. We were there. Um, so the movement would not have gotten where it did without the women who are on the front lines. And the people who are not on the front lines, to me, are just as important as the Somebody's got to have your back if you're on the front line. Somebody who's cooking a hot meal for you. Somebody who's going to clean you up when you come back covered with mustard and ketchup. Not that that's likely to happen now. Somebody who's driving people back, somebody who's just blending in the crowd, watching what's happening, able to now you film it with your device or um, call the lawyers, call the organizers, whatever is happening. So women had a crucial role then, and I, I don't think it's going to succeed. Anything to make without the women there doing their part. It's just they don't get the credit in the media, in the history books. But who writes the history books? <laughs> who are most of the reporters? It's getting better, with all due respect. <laughs> but, um, yeah, those history books are basically written by guys. And they leave us out. With all due respect to anybody here who's gentleman who may have written a history book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. What can we do to see the whole movie? Buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 90 minute movie. Um, yeah. Well, you, you can, it's, you can get on Amazon Prime to speak there right now. Um, we have DVDs here. You can get it you know, uh, off the website as well. Okay. Can we buy it and buy the rights to show it to a group on campus? Does it, it cost extra to do that? It, it does cost extra. Yeah. So we just get in touch with you. Yeah, I live here, so. <laughs> <laughs> what was your involvement with the March on Washington? Were you there? Or I was there. I worked most of the summer in their press office in Washington, basically typing. Yeah, I was a dynamite type. In English, almost with a couple other languages. 
same thing. But, uh, yeah, basically I was there in the best, best section type. And then I went down to the margin and worked at the press tent, handing out little kits of information to the press. But I didn't, I didn't hear the speeches. I took a band or something with a bunch of us in the tents down to where we could hear
I could draw tacks events open my mouth that I was a southerner. <laughs> and I think I know a case where that really made a big impact in Jackson. And it takes all of us to make a Not just one group, not just another, you need allies, you need coalition partners. And I could use the fact that I was white. I could go to Glen Echo amusement park, which was segregated in Maryland. I could go in just nonchalantly and buy a handful of tickets. You have to give a ticket every time you took a ride. I could get a whole fistful. Walk back out and hand them out to the buddies who headed on down to the merry-go-round. Because you know, where's the back of the merry-go-round? Um, <laughs> I could go up and get passes for my friends, of course, in the state legislature, for people to go sit in the galleries and watch the debates. And I turn around and go back to the black section of town, and they got handed out to prominent <laughs> black ministers, and they could use them, to go sit in the galleries for the first time. The next week, of course, the law was changed, and you had to 